Hey Connect, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Chris, get to serve as one of the pastors on the team here, and just thrilled you decided to join us today. So uh, way back in college, I slept on the streets of Denver for five nights in a row. And I didn't just do this one time, I did this all four years of college, the week leading up to Labor Day weekend. And what my friends and I would do is we'd grab a tent, we'd post up on the sidewalk outside of Sports Authority, and we would go spend the night there, come back to campus, go to class, do our thing, go to practice, whatever we had to do, and then every night we'd go back and we'd sleep on the sidewalk outside of Sports Authority. Now, one uh, year in particular, I think it was my senior year, I hope, for my sake, it was my senior year. There, the morning after one of the nights that we slept on the, the streets of Denver, we found out someone had been shot just blocks away the night before. So you may ask, why, Chris, would you give up the comfort of your bed, the safety of your apartment, to sleep on the streets of Denver? Because I wanted a $100 gift card. Seriously, I wanted a $100 gift card, and I wanted to be one of the first into Snee Grab, sports authorities blow out ski and snowboard sale. Now, uh, also in college, uh, one summer, I was a camp counselor up at Camp Timberline in Estes Park. So naturally, at the end of the summer, I invited my campers to join me for Snee Grab. Of course, I didn't do that. But what is true is Amanda and I were dating at the time. She was living in Parker, I was living up in Estes Park, and if you know anything about camp life, it's pretty much a 24-7 gig. So I'm with the campers day in, day out, all the time, seemingly all week long, but I did get an evening off a week. And a couple of times that summer, Amanda drove from Parker to Estes so that we could go on a date that evening. Now, why? Why would you drive four hours, two hours there, two hours back for dinner and mini golf? May I introduce you to yours truly? <laughs> that might not be a compelling why for you, but when we're motivated, when we've got something like a reason when we've got a compelling why, we will do some pretty crazy things. We'll take out an astronomical loan, something way, way, way beyond what we can reasonably take on so that we can get the car. We'll wake up stupid early and we'll get on 470 in hopes of getting on 70 before traffic. And we'll still probably sit in hours of it. We'll pay an arm and a leg and give up the weekends for the rest of our life so that our kid can play club sports and hopefully, just hopefully, they'll get a scholarship. You know, when our why is compelling, we'll do things that are normal for us but seem crazy to others. And nowhere is this more true than in our faith and following of Jesus. You see, when Jesus is our why, he changes how we live. And what, what seems normal to us as followers of him, others would, would look on our lives and think, what? They're crazy. And yet, that's what we're seeing in this Transform series. You see, when, when we encounter Jesus, he changes us, profoundly changes us, so much so that we can't keep living like we once did. We live a completely new life. And that life looks crazy to those who don't know Jesus like we know Jesus. So if you want to see this for yourself, we're in Ephesians 5 today. We're going to start in verses 1 through 21. That's what we'll cover today. We'll pick it up uh, again next week and finish the chapter. But Ephesians 5, 1 through 21, you can follow along there. We've got free Bibles in the back. We've got a church app. You can follow along, take notes there as well. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Lord, we come before you, and uh, you are so good. You are all that we need, and we want to encounter you. We want to hear from you right now. Would you change us by the work of your spirit in us? Would we know you more and would we live like it? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul begins Ephesians 5 and he reminds us of our why as followers of Jesus. He says this, follow God's example, therefore, 
as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering in sacrifice to God. Throughout Ephesians, Paul reminds the church there in Ephesus again and again of the good news of Jesus. And so that we don't ever forget it, I'm going to remind us of this again as well. You see, we were stuck in our sin. We, we were destined for death, life apart from God forever. But God in his love, he richly showed mercy to us. And now because he loves us, and because Jesus came and gave his life, laid down his life for us, taking our sin upon him because of Jesus, we now can have life with God. We get eternal life with God. No longer are we disconnected from God. We now are connected with him in Christ. This is why we live the way we live. Why? Because God is love and God loves us unconditionally. Like me as a dad. And, and I, I love my girls even when they are disrespectful to me or even when they say something hurtful to their sister, my love for them doesn't change. Just like my love for them is unconditional, God's love is infinitely more unconditional for us. And, and as God through Jesus loved us, we are called to love others, or as Paul put it, walk in the way of love. As God's beloved children, we're called to emulate our Father's love. 1 John 4.19 has been a rally cry for our church where it says this, we love because he first loved us. He's why we love. He's the, he's the reason we love everyone. Him, he expressed his love to us first and now we, in response, express love to others. From the world's perspective, why would anyone serve on a Sunday when there is fresh powder in the mountains? Why would anyone offer a place to live to someone who doesn't have a place to live? Why would anyone give up their free time to mentor an at-risk youth? Well, let me tell you why. Jesus is our why. And, and, and when we encounter him, he changes us from the inside out. We can't help but walk in the way of love. And similarly, Jesus has delivered us from darkness. So we live as children of the light, as Paul explained next, now in verses 3 through 14. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes visible. A light. That is why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, the way of the world may be two consenting adults, financing it, uh, making the sarcastic comment in hopes of getting a laugh. That might be the way of the world, but we no longer live like what we once did. We were rescued out of darkness, and now we are children of the light, so we live as children of the light. Or as Paul wrote, the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Uh, we're children of the light. We don't hide in the dark. We live in the light. We, we aren't privately, uh, secretly searching porn in hopes that our spouse won't find out. 
We, we aren't gossiping behind their back as if, you know, putting them down makes us feel a little better about ourselves. We don't live that way. We're children of the light. We got nothing to hide. By the power of the Spirit at work in us, we're different people. We don't live like what we once did. We seek what is good, what is righteous, what is true. In Matthew 5, Jesus was teaching his followers, and he said this. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As followers of Jesus, we're the light of the world. Jesus changes us, and when he changes us, our lives look different to those around us. And we don't hide our light under a bowl. We're not ashamed of our identity in Christ. We let it shine through. So when the conversation takes a, a turn for the worst, we're not going to just let it go there and not participate. No, no, we're going to stand up for what's right. And even if the person that's being talked about isn't present, we're going to redirect that conversation to something positive. Uh, even when uh, we're out with friends and, and they're getting tipsy and they want another round, we're not going to passively permit it because we're more than a designated driver. We're their friend. And we're a voice of wisdom when they need it most. Jesus says, in these ways, when we live out our faith, in these ways, let, we let our light shine before others that they may see our good deeds and praise God. G give glory to our Father in heaven. That's what he says. Because remember, God's will for us is transformation in Christ. And that is for our good, but it is ultimately for God's glory. It's ultimately for his glory. And when Jesus changes us and, and lights up our life, forgives us from our sin, pulls us out of darkness, we live as children of the light. We don't, we don't cover our light. We let it shine. So you know what? We have a decision to make. When, when we live in a way that looks different from the way the world lives, and when the people around us take notice, we have a decision to make. Are we going to cover our light in hopes of them not thinking we're weird? Or are we going to let our light shine for all to see so that they give glory to our Father in heaven? I, uh, I think of a dinner I got to have, Amanda and I got to have with Jeff and Marcy Percival about a month or so ago. And at dinner, we were just talking about life and what Marcy does for work, and she was sharing. Yeah, she's an interior designer, but she loves opportunities to share Jesus with her clients, even though they're probably not Christians. And she says, I, whether it's a painting on the wall, whether it's something in a conversation, she seizes that opportunity to share the hope that she has in Jesus. You see, Marcy's made the decision. She's going to let her light shine. I just want to know who's with her. Are we with her? Because Jesus wants us to let our light shine for all to see. Paul advises as follows in verses 15 and 16. He says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. When Jesus is our why, we live wisely. Every day, every conversation, every interaction... We've got a choice to make. Are we going to live foolishly or are we going to live wisely? And as, as followers of Jesus, we want to live wisely. We want to do the right thing. Even those of us who don't follow Jesus, we probably want to live wisely. And sometimes the wise way is clear. And I am so grateful for those times. But there are times when the wise way isn't apparent. It's not as easy to identify what, what is the wise thing to do. Well, that's actually one of the questions that I ask myself. And it's not because I came up with it. I actually heard another pastor share that. Andy Stanley is a pastor in Atlanta. He actually gives a couple of questions that I find very helpful when I'm trying to discern what is the wise way? What does it look like for me to live wisely? And the first question is, what is the wise thing to do? 
Sometimes just pausing and asking that question, what is the wise thing to do? It's like, oh, okay, it's this. Another question I find helpful is, what's the story you want to tell? What's the story you want to tell? Because after the, the interaction, the conversation, the circumstance, whatever, when it's all said and done, it's just going to be a story that we tell. So is it a story that we want to tell? Is it a story that we're proud of? So similarly, when I am at an impasse or a crossroads, I'll find myself asking, okay, what's the story I want to tell to my wife, to my kids, to my friends, to my coworkers? What's the story I want to tell? Look, you're not going to find these questions, what's the wise thing to do, what's the story I want to tell? You're not going to find them explicitly stated in Scripture. But living wisely is a theme throughout Scripture. And this is what we are called to as followers of Jesus. We're called to live wisely. Just like we're called to walk in the way of love, live as children of the light, we are called to live wisely. Now here's the thing. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you know that at some point, our best effort to walk in the way of love, live as children of the light, to you know, live wisely, our best effort, eventually it's going to come up short. We woke up on the wrong side of the bed. We said something we didn't mean. Whatever it is, eventually we will slip up. We'll we'll fall. And that's why I'm so grateful that Paul saved the best for last. You see, the fourth thing that we're called to as followers of Jesus is to be filled with the Spirit. Paul explained it this way in verses 17 through 21. It says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And here's how he explains what that looks like. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the the Spirit of God in us that empowers us to follow Jesus, to live differently, to no longer live as we once did. So what does it look like to be filled with the Spirit? Scripture has a ton to say about this. In this passage, to, to the church in Ephesus, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, chose to highlight three things. The first is singing praise. Second is giving thanks. And the third is submitting to one another. In verse 19, Paul described being filled with the Spirit as speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Well, what we learn from this passage is that we are a people who who praise God in the shower, who praise God in the car, who praise God in corporate worship. We praise God anywhere and everywhere because of who God is and what he's done. His praise will ever be on our lips. In verse 20, we see the second thing of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. Paul shares that being filled with the Spirit also entails always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in the Spirit, we thank God for our health. We thank God for our friends and our family. We thank Him for a roof over our head, clothes to wear, food to eat. We thank Him for being just. We thank Him for being merciful. We we thank Him for the sunshine. We thank Him for the rain. If we think of it, we can thank Him for it. Because what did the text say? It said, always giving thanks to God for everything. Everything? Like, like. Even the diagnosis, even the loss of the job, even traffic. That would be crazy in the eyes of our world. And yet I have witnessed our church family do that. I've, I've heard Brenda say how thankful she is for how she experienced God through her bout with cancer. I've seen Tyler being pushed out of a job, trusting God in the process, and then at the end of the year, thanking God for providing far more than he could ask or imagine. I've even seen Alex thank God for traffic because it gave him extra time with the Lord. It's like bonus time. We are supposed to thank God for everything. 
We've got a lot of thinking to do. You know, praising God, it's like, okay, yeah, I could probably do that. Thanking God, I could grow in that. But the third, submitting to one another, oh, come on. I mean, that is so not the 21st century in our country. And yet, that's what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. Paul included this in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the third expression of being filled with the Spirit. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's a message in and of itself. So we're going to put a pin there, and we're going to come back to that next time. And we're going to spend the whole, whole time together talking about what does it look like to have Jesus-centered relationships. Like when Jesus is our why, how does he change how we relate with one another? It's a pretty, pretty profound change from what's normal this day and age. But we'll talk about that next time. Throughout this passage, in this message, there have been a, a lot of, of do's and do not do's. And because of that, I want to remind us one more time that we are saved by God's grace through our faith in Jesus. We're not loved because of what we do or do not do. God just loves us. He is love. He loves us unconditionally. And because he loves us and we recognize that we, we can't imagine living like we once lived. We've been rescued out of darkness. We live as children of the light. Because when Jesus is our why, he changes how we live. So imagine with me being so profoundly changed by Jesus that, that we no longer succumb to the lust because we've experienced his love and we walk in the way of love. Imagine not, not going there in the conversation. Like you're not going to you're not going to tell the joke even if it's going to get a laugh because we're different. We're people who speak the truth in love. We use our words to build others up, not to tear them down. We're different. Some might call us crazy. But we don't get drunk to take the edge off, gain a client or even have fun. Because we know what it's like to be filled with the spirit and follow his lead. You know, if, if we live this way, others might think that we're crazy. But Jesus celebrates it because we are letting our light shine like a lamp on a stand. Now imagine with me if collectively, like you and me and you and you and you, if we all collectively, we let our light shine together. Imagine what that could look like in South Denver. If we were like a city on a hill, like Jesus illustrated it. What could that look like? You know, individually, it might not be, you know, we're not going to succumb to lust. Collectively, what if we saw human trafficking end in Jesus' name? Uh, I don't know. Let's take another one. Uh, imagine, you know, we've got, we've got a, an issue in Douglas County, South Denver, uh, and it's a really heartbreaking one of people taking their lives. What if instead of someone taking their life, they experience Jesus' love so profoundly through us that he loves them unconditionally. And while they're in the valley right now, he is with them in it. And maybe, just maybe, he placed us there to walk with them through it. And we're, we love this person who's at the, the lowest of lows. And by God's grace, they encounter Jesus through us. And, and instead of taking their life, they decide to surrender their life to Jesus. And then they decide to lay their life down right alongside us and let their light shine in South Denver too. How's that for a testimony? I bet Jesus would be praised and God would be glorified when that light shines too. Imagine, imagine if we had to leave for church earlier on Sundays because there's so much traffic because people just want to gather for worship not just at Connect Church, but at all the Jesus-centered churches in South Denver. Imagine that. I imagine marriages restored, friendships formed, families rebuilt. You see, when we collectively shine our light, we have the potential to be a part of something way bigger than ourselves. Ultimately, what Jesus does, it's up to him. But what Jesus calls us to is very clear. Very, very clear. We're a city on a hill, shining his light to South Denver. 
in hopes of seeing his kingdom come right here as it is in heaven. So what's considered crazy from others when they look at our lives, that's just, that's just normal for us. It's like a Tuesday. And, and we live this way, not by our power, but by his power. We walk in the way of love. We live as children of the light. We live wisely. And we are filled with the Spirit because when Jesus is our why, he changes how we live. To God be the glory. So Lord, we come before you right now and ask that you would work in us to that end. Because left to our own devices, we get tired. We drop the ball. We get frustrated. Uh, we go back to the way we had been living. And while that's normal for most, you've called us to something different. So would you help us to walk in love as you have loved us? Would we love others? Would you help us to let our light shine for all to see? Would we not be ashamed of who we are in you? Would we be celebratory and joyous in our sharing of who you are? Would you reveal the wise way to us? And would you give us the courage to go that way? And when people encounter us, would they encounter you because of your spirit in us? Would we be characterized by the fruit of your spirit? And would people look at us and not be in awe of us, but would they be in awe of you? And in it all, would we see your kingdom come and your will be done here in South Denver as it is in heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.